When I booked my flight to come out here, I used an app on this phone. When I got to my connection in Denver and found out that my next flight was canceled, I used an app on this phone to rent a car so I could drive through the Rocky Mountains at night and get here at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's right. And when the very kind organizers of this event called me to tell me that I was out of my mind and that there was an avalanche alert, I used another app on this phone to chicken out, get a hotel, and take a later flight. It's unbelievable how convenient it was to not get here on time. We have very powerful technology in our pockets. Technology, 30 years ago, no one would have ever thought we would have this. No one would have thought that you would have access to everything in the world, everywhere you go, pay all your bills, get all the knowledge. No one would have thought it. Highly doubt it. And you know what's funny is that we take that for granted. You would pay money for a rusty old bicycle that you'd have to fix up to get it to work. You'd expect that. You'd never expect to have to pay for infinite knowledge. Doesn't make sense. Now, 30 years ago, we didn't imagine it would be that convenient not to get somewhere, but we imagined a lot of other things. So let's talk about that for a bit. You know what would have made it really convenient for me to get here today? If I had one of those. <laughs> now, we were supposed to have flying cars now. It's 2019. We were promised this, right? Now, raise your hand if you've got one. No one. It's interesting. Well, I'm sure we've got something else that we've achieved. Uh, who here has been on a space taxi to Mars? No one? All right, I'm going to throw a softball. 50 years ago was the first time we went to the moon. So, who's vacationed there recently? Does anyone have a timeshare on the moon? No? Well, I do have some good news for you. If you grew up in the 80s, you wanted a hoverboard real bad. And we've got them. This is what they look like. Now take the word hover with a grain of salt. If you take it too literally, you might get in trouble. If you try to hover over a lake, you'll get a little wet. You might get a little electrocuted, too. So what's going on? When it comes to software, we've made more progress than anyone ever thought was possible. We surpassed our imagination. But when it comes to everything else, hardware, physical devices, not only have we not caught up, we've not even caught, kept up with our own expectations. Why? It makes no sense. Especially when you consider that everything, wrong button, everything is done on computers today. Software and hardware, when you design a product, you do it on the computer. Shouldn't computing power be making it easier to innovate, regardless of what you're innovating? You know, the reason that we had all that progress in software was because we had three things. We had the will to innovate, we had a way to innovate, and we had a reason to innovate. We had a why. You demand a lot of software. Now, we know that there's a will to innovate hardware. We foresaw it happening, but we don't have it. So let's talk about the way. Is it easy to design new products? No. And this is why. Computers are run on software. This should not be a big surprise to you, but software is written in text. And software loves text. Software is great at analyzing all kinds of two-dimensional data. It's great at it. Here's the problem. We live in a 3D world. Now, even if you think the Earth is flat, we're not squished together right now because we have depth. So at least here, we have three dimensions. But your computer doesn't understand them. There's a reason for that. Yes, we have computer programs that can work in 3D, that allow you to create things in 3D, but they are totally different systems. They don't communicate well. 
you can't normalize that data very well. So when your computer sees this, it makes it very hard for it to give you the same tools you would expect. And I'm not talking complicated tools. I'm not talking about groundbreaking things that you would see in a sci-fi movie. I'm talking about stuff we've had for decades. Search, autofill, spell check. The equivalence of those things never existed in 3D. Why should you care? If you're not an engineer or a designer or a researcher, you might never work in 3D. But everything in this room was built after being designed in 3D. So we should pay a little bit of attention. Let me take you through not even a whole day, just a snippet of a day of the life of an engineer or anyone who works in 3D. Imagine you go into a library. You have to do this via analogy. You walk into a library and you say to the librarian, hi, I would like to borrow a book, and that book is A Tale of Two Cities. And the librarian says, OK, where is it? And you say, I don't know. You're the librarian. I'm asking you where my book is. The librarian says, OK, well, you're lucky. I'm actually a very organized librarian. We have two million books in this library, but I went ahead and separated fiction and nonfiction. So is it fiction or nonfiction? It's fiction? Great. It was going to take a long time if you didn't know. Um, now that you know that it's fiction, all you have to do is go down this aisle here and uh, see if you can find that book. Now, most of these books don't have labels on them or titles on them. Some of them do, but I wouldn't really trust the ones that do because sometimes they're mislabeled. So you're going to have to look at the inside of every single one of them to really know if it's a tale of two cities. And you say, that's insane. I don't have time for that. And librarian says, don't worry. We have an alternative. We have a typewriter over here. You can just type the book from scratch. <laughs> that sounds so preposterous. We would never do that. And it's hard for us to even imagine going into a library in the first place. Let's be honest, who's done that recently? When it comes to engineers, OK. <laughs> not many of you raised your hands, though. When it comes to engineers, sure, they're not walking into a physical library, but the difficulty of finding those models is extremely high. And we're not talking about all of the work they do. We're just talking about getting started, finding a model in the first place. What does this have to do with flying cars? Why should you care? I have to warn you. I'm about to show you the scariest slide you've ever seen in your life. Viewer discretion is advised. There it is. If you're not scared, you're not reading it right. Studies are showing that when it comes to productivity and our potential, we're only utilizing one-fifth, 20%. Let me put that in perspective for you. The past 30 years, we've only had six years worth of progress. To get where we thought we would be today, 30 years ago, as of now, we would need an additional 120 years at this rate. I'm sorry to say, most of us won't be alive then. And even if you don't care about flying cars or going to Mars or any other cool gadgets, you should still be scared. Because most of you care about something. It might be saving the environment. It might be saving the world from hunger or curing cancer. And you should know that the solution to many of those types of problems is in the red part of that pie chart. We are unbelievably lucky. We are the most creative and the smartest animals on Earth. People love gold and diamonds, but you know that gold and diamonds are extremely plentiful in the universe? You know it's not? You. Forget this. Your mind has amazing potential in it. But do you know that for hundreds of thousands of years, we were living in a dark age of innovation? You know what the most dangerous weapon we humans had until just a few hundred years ago? The spear. The pointy stick was the best we could do. And it was just roughly in the past hundred years 
that we found a better and faster form of transportation than literally sitting on the back of a faster animal. Now, the reason that 30 years ago we thought we would be so much further is because, think about it, 30 years ago we were looking back at the past century and we had seen more innovation, more progress than the millennia before then. Not only are you rare in the sense that you're a human, you're rare because of when you were born. Very few people in the history of mankind got to see progress like you did. We've seen more progress in our lifetimes than most of our ancestors would have seen in generations. This scares me. We cannot afford a second innovation dark age. It's not fair. It's not fair to our children. We weren't born just to give. We were born to take. Sorry, other way around. We weren't born <laughs> just to take. We were born to give. You can look at it either way. So how do we solve it? As I mentioned, there are three elements. You need a will, you need a desire, and the willingness to dare to innovate. Now we have that. That's what makes us human. That's the amazing thing that we have in this room is that we all have this burning desire to create something new. You've got ideas. Every single one of you has an idea. Not all of you are executing on it, which is a shame. But you've got ideas. You're creative people. Now, when it comes to the way, I did mention that there have been problems. There have been legitimate excuses, if you will, to not have faster product innovation. But that's not the engineer's fault. It's those of us in the software community. It's our fault. Because we were allowed software to stay biased. Now, I'm immensely proud of one thing. I led a team for the past few years that addressed this problem, and recently, in the past year, we were actually able to make computers think in 3D and give engineers those tools they were missing. That makes me immensely proud, but at the same time, it makes me enraged, because if we were able to do that in a couple of years, why did no one else take that on over decades? It blows my mind. But that's not what I need you to take away from here today. That third point, the why, is the most important of the three elements. Everybody lift up your phone real quick, please. I see a sea in front of me of glass rectangles. <laughs> Your last phone was a glass rectangle. And if you accidentally drop that phone right now and it shatters, you will go out and buy another glass rectangle. You drove here today in a car that had rubber wheels. Your last car had rubber wheels, and your next one will probably have rubber wheels. You're not demanding enough. We are so used to slow progress. Why would they innovate faster? It's a lot cheaper to give you a product that's 2% better than a revolutionary product that's 200% better. So if you'll spend your hard-earned money on another glass rectangle, why give you anything else? Now that you know that the will and the way are all around you, and that as of 2019, it is possible for us to innovate at the speed of our imagination, Start to demand the extraordinary. I want to tell you that I actually do know where my flying car is. It's parked right next to the cure for cancer. It's parked right next to all the unfulfilled inventions. And they're all in one place. It's a big field full of stones. And under those stones, there's six feet of earth. There's a head, there's a mind of a great man or woman who had the will, the intelligence, the drive to create those solutions, but they never did. The way is not the excuse anymore, it's the why. I ask you here today to pledge that you will expect more in the future to do anything else or anything less is an insult to humanity. Thank you.